At 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A 13-year-old boy flown to a hospital after a pit bull attack at a home on the far north side. We have been following this story since we first brought it to you as breaking news at 5. Authorities do think that boy will survive, but the wounds are serious. Our John Paul Barajas live at the scene. It's not far from TPC Parkway and Evans Road to give you an idea. John Paul, what are neighbors saying about this horrible attack? Steve, Maya, we spoke to a few neighbors off camera and, and they were shocked. They were in disbelief. They said the family that lives at this home has been nothing but nice to them. And as for the six adult pit bulls that live there, the neighbors didn't even know they had that many dogs inside the house. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar tells us all six dogs belong to the family, that they are likely raised for retail, and that all of the six dogs have been removed from the home by Animal Care Services. The sheriff says two are likely to be euthanized. The other four will be under a 10-day observation period. This time, they don't know what provoked the dogs to attack the young boy. The sheriff does know the victim was being watched by a grandparent at the time of the incident, and that's who called 911. Heard the young boy screaming. Uh, came into the room and saw at least one, possibly up to all six of these pit bulls piled up on the, on the young boy, attacking him in the, in, the, in the process of attacking him. These are some large pit bulls. Again, the boy was life flighted and is expected to survive. The sheriff tipped his hat to the deputy that responded, who happens to be one of only two deputies that are fully trained paramedics on staff. And the sheriff also says right now it is too early to tell if the parents will be facing any charges. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. The search for a stolen truck ends in three people shot, one of them killed. It happened in the South Park Mall parking lot today. Now it is still early in the investigation, but so far police believe this is a case of self-defense. Lee Waldman explains what happened. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says a vehicle stolen from South Park Mall today was tracked down by the vehicle's owner. The owner forced the man and woman inside of it out at gunpoint and called police. That's when the alleged car thief pulled out his own gun and shot the owner. The owner then fired back, killing the suspect and wounding the woman who was with him. That woman and the vehicle's owner were both taken to the hospital. Police are still investigating, but at this point, the chief says the owner acted in self-defense. Mall goers were shocked by what they saw unfolded today. Yeah, I saw cops coming behind my truck, but I didn't know where they were heading to or going to. We would prefer that call the police before taking that into your own hands, but he did what he felt he needed to do. We asked the chief if they'd be increasing patrols around the mall today in light of this shooting. He says not at this point. Out South Park Mall, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Seguin police now looking for a caregiver who is now under investigation and his caregiving skills also very much in question. Seguin police say Corey Gill left three mentally disabled adults inside a hot car for so long that someone who was concerned called 911. Gill now charged with three counts of deadly conduct. When police arrived on the scene, a man was walking around the Stratton Oak Apartments asking for water. Two other men, one wearing a winter coat, sweating inside a car with the windows only slightly opened. By the way, temperatures today, as most of us know, in the triple digits. If something doesn't look right, if it looks suspicious, looks like someone may be hurt um, or like they're not being treated right, like in this case, to give us a call, we'd much rather come out and it be just a misunderstanding. Thankfully, she did call. Chaluti says Gill was suspended from his place of work after an adult protective service investigation was launched. If you have any information about where he may be, call the Guadalupe County Crime Stoppers tip line. That number 1-800-403. TIPS, your tips can remain anonymous. An update now to a tragic story on the southwest side. We have learned the name of a four-year-old girl who drowned, Hazita Hernandez Cervera. According to SAPD, the girl was reported missing around 8 o'clock last night in the 9100 block of Ocean Gate. Police say the girl got away during a family gathering. Officers searched the area and found her face down in an above-ground pool. The four-year-old was taken to a nearby hospital where she died. Tonight, we also know the name of the man killed in a crash on Loop 410. He's been identified as 47-year-old Lee John Maher. SAPD says Maher actually crashed his motorcycle into a guardrail on Loop 410 at Via Main on Tuesday 
After hitting the rail, he was hit by a dump truck. Mayor was pronounced dead at the scene. The truck driver stayed after hitting him. No charges expected to be filed. I just want the family to know that I, I truly am sorry. A sentence of 35 years in prison for carjacking and running over a man who was fixing a flat tire. Erica Hernandez in court as the video of that crime was shown and what the defendant, Jose Gonzalez, said to the victim's family. It's something that I have to live with the rest of my life. On August 14, 2021, Mario Renteria was changing a tire at a southeast side Texaco when Jose Gonzalez approaches him gets in his truck, and then proceeds to run Renteria over. Gonzalez then crashes into the gas station, goes inside, causing chaos, and resists arrest, kicking two officers. He told the judge he was high on several different drugs, wasn't himself that night, and was sorry for his actions. Not only am I embarrassed, but I truly am sorry. And I take full, you know, I take full responsibility for, for what happened that night. I just want the family to know that I, I truly am sorry. Judge Stephanie Boyd handed down the maximum sentence of 35 years per the plea deal. Someone who is merely trying to change their tire and now they're dead through no fault of their own. So that's an issue. After that 35 year sentence, victim impact letters were read in the courtroom and we heard more about who Mario Renteria was. My dad was caring, hardworking, and he respected by many. He was also very intelligent, wise, and attentive. What I loved most, of, most was hearing my dad laugh, and what I admired most was his heart. He was a good person who had so much life to live and has been taken away due to a senseless act of violence. Gonzalez will get credit for time served and must serve half before he's eligible for parole. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. We can all feel it. This summer, we are seeing no shortage of 100 degree days in San Antonio. And new Metro Health stats going back to 2018 show the five worst weeks for heat related illness have all happened this summer, with the highest being 82 cases in the middle of June. And the advice you hear so often is get out of the heat, stay indoors. But many San Antonians are living without air conditioning. Gary Berger brings us one woman's story on the challenges and a very cool gift. Inside her east side home, Maria Sullivan might not be beating the heat, but she is bearing it. Yeah, I adjusted, I think, with all the heat. There's no central AC, and one of her window units broke a few years ago. And the other? This is the one I have, but it doesn't really get cold, especially when it's really hot. So she makes do with a pair of fans, one of which isn't always reliable either. It's new, but it only lasts about an hour, and it stops. She avoids staying in the kitchen. I make my food and I come and I start eating over here because over there it's too hot. And worries about how the heat may affect her health. Well, yeah, but you just have to make do. Because, she says, she doesn't have the money to fix it. She's surviving on her husband's pension. With that, I pay the electricity, the water and the rent. Fortunately for Sullivan, community organizers with Westcare Texas brought her a new air conditioner today. They don't do many air conditioners, but they do give out fans. And they say Sullivan is far from the only one in this situation. It has to be a bunch and bunches. Westcare organizers say they often see this problem at older homes like Miss Sullivan's, where air conditioning wasn't built into it. And the folks there can't afford a fix. Seniors, uh, single, single parents. Moms. So, you know, and there's a lot of people that are maybe have a husband and wife, but they can't afford it. Their electricity bills are too high, so they can't, if they do have it, they can't really run it. But Sullivan is happy with the help and looking forward to cooler days ahead. No, pues voy a estar bien. Well, I'm going to be good, and it's not going to be hot. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. You know, there's so many people mm -hmm. like Maria out there who don't have air conditioning in their home. And, you know, they, they will go to the library or they will go to local yes, churches find or places place. like that to try to find a place to stay cool. A community center, sometimes the city opens up those up to remind people they have a cool place to go. It's so important this time of year, Adam. And this is completely unscientific, but something that I found in the past helped me to keep cool was to take a like beach towel, drench it in water and then completely wring it out as, as much as you can wrap that around myself and then that evaporation of that water takes a little bit of heat away from the body that evaporative cooling effect. That's just something 
I do. I'm not saying everybody should do it. Anyway, 100 degrees our high temperature today. The record 106, the average 96 degrees. 32 100 degree days so far this year. The count continues, but actually tomorrow we're forecasting 99 for a change, right? We do have the newest drought monitor in a look at the African dust when it's going to move on out of here and an update on the tropics in a bit. Thank you, Adam. Days after the Uvalde City Council approved a special election for the mayoral seat, Kimberly Rubio is joining the race. Rubio lost her daughter Lexi in the Robb Elementary School shooting in May 2022 in Uvalde. Since then, she's become a gun violence prevention advocate traveling to our state and nation's capital, rallying for change. Rubio, also president of the nonprofit Lives Robbed, which was started in the wake of the Robb Elementary shooting. She tells us ever since she lost her daughter, she wants to bring change to Uvalde. I've been very vocal about the fact that I had plans to move, um, and then especially after the events of May 24th. But ultimately, I decided to stay in Uvalde and stay with Lexi and be part of the change that this community needs and deserves. The current Uvalde mayor, Don McLaughlin, actually announced he is running for the Texas House of Representatives District 80 seat. That's why there will be a special election. It will happen on November 7th. After the speculation about the Spurs moving back downtown, today officials with the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo say they are not going anywhere. This morning, the CEO of the Rodeo, Cody Davenport, released a statement saying in part, quote, our home is in the AT&T Center and the Freeman grounds, end quote. The Spurs lease at the AT&T Center lasts until 2032, but the team is having informal discussions with the city about a possible move downtown. Davenport also says the rodeo remains committed to the east side. Check out Transit Guide right now. This is 281 at Loop 410. It's the southbound lanes of 281 as you get on Loop 410 West. And this is kind of welcome, especially after I think we looked at this yesterday and it was backed up. Mm -hmm. Not so bad today at 281 and Loop 410. He is a Hispanic icon known for his work as a civil rights activist. Starting this spring, the Alamo Colleges District is honoring Cesar Chavez. ACD recognizing his birthday as an official holiday. Coming up, Jesse DeGriado shares why this move is so important and might just be the stepping stone to something more. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. So we know that mental health matters. Deadly fires are up in San Antonio this year, and tonight at 10, we'll discuss how fire officials are making the mental health of their firefighters a top priority. Plus, building the next generation of business owners. Some San Antonio teens are redefining what entrepreneurship means, what they're learning now, and how it's going to help them in the future. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. A new paid holiday next year for the Alamo Colleges District. This will fall on March 31st, the birthday of the late Cesar Chavez. The city of San Antonio did the same last year to honor the iconic leader of the United Farm Workers. Now, the district says it has 5,000 faculty and staff and 65,000 students at, five, at its five campuses. Jesse DeGriado tonight talks to one of the leaders behind the Cesar Chavez Day. These students enrolling for the fall at San Antonio College will be among the first come this spring to have a new holiday, honoring one of the founders of the United Farm Workers, the late Cesar Chavez. The chairman of the Cesar E. Chavez Legacy and Educational Foundation, Ernest Martinez, says the new holiday helps to further its mission. No better way to do that than to have a holiday uh, at an in educational institution like Alamo College's district. For Martinez, helping to lead the charge was personal. Chavez and his father, labor leader and civil rights advocate Jaime Martinez, were close friends. Those I spoke to here at San Antonio College told me the unanimous vote by their board of trustees says a lot. We're giving the representation that's needed for the, the things that Cesar Chavez had uh, fought for. For Daniel Sustaita, a longtime employee, it's about more than getting a paid holiday. 
for me, it's a recognition of Hispanic heritage, really. Honoring a man like Cesar Chavez with a holiday for us is a great accomplishment. An iconic figure whose fight for farm workers is well known. I'm sure it hit close to home. Martinez says he saw that before they took the vote. This is testimony after testimony after testimony of trustees with their personal connection. They say the holiday starting next year, marking Cesar Chavez's birthday on March 31st, will serve to inspire and motivate. This holiday is a catapult for things to come. Not only does Martinez want to see every educational institution in San Antonio do the same. It's time for other cities to start mobilizing and thinking about a national holiday for Cesar Chavez. A lot of work ahead, but as Cesar says, si se puede, right? That was Jesse Degollado reporting. A All right, well, let's turn to weather now. Yeah, the forecast. It's hot out there, but you might notice something in the sky a little bit more so today, Adam. Yeah, I noticed it myself a little bit more, just that haze on the horizon. You really notice it when you take those flyover ramps, those really high ramps, you know, 410 and I-10, 1604, 281. You get the idea. And you look off into the distance. Here's a view from our city cam, and this is overlooking 410 and I-10. And this is a good vantage point because... One of our one of our little benchmarks here is downtown. See how it's blurred out a little bit? That's because of this extra haze in the sky compared to a completely dust-free, haze-free day. Here's a look at the Saharan dust that's overhead. It's light to moderate amounts. I'd almost even just put it into that moderate category. Tomorrow it's going to be even lighter, I think, uh, in light amounts and then very light into Saturday and then by Sunday it's completely gone. So it does look like now it's going to linger a bit into Saturday and then by Sunday it's completely out of here. And then we don't have to think about it again for the foreseeable future. It's gone. The air quality not affected by this dust. It's still at moderate levels, which is a step down from good. Good's the best category you can have. There's no great. There's just good, moderate, and then you get into unhealthy. It's at the moderate levels. You look at the live readings from our sensors, our air quality monitoring stations across San Antonio and Bear County. They're all in the yellow right now, and that's a good sign. So asthma, if you have asthma or allergies from it, it's unlikely that the dust would really play a big role, at least this go around. Here's the newest drought monitor updated today. What really stands out right here locally and in our hill country, the extreme and exceptional drought that is uh, not getting any better. And unfortunately, it's just growing bigger. And now we're all starting to dry out and fall into these drought categories. Coming up at 645, I'll have a comparison of just five weeks ago compared to now and show you the changes that have happened since we've fallen into the heat high, the spell of the heat high. And there it is centered over New Mexico. So the door's open for a disturbance and there is one over the Gulf of Mexico. This little swirl here in the Western Gulf, that counterclockwise circulation, it's an inverted trough that's drifting westward, but it's not close enough to us and we don't have all the ingredients to even kickstart some showers and storms. We're too dry and we're too stable. Even if it did hit us, I don't think it would drum up anything. And then notice how that heat high gets a little bit closer to us for the middle and end of uh, next week. Here's a look at the tropics. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a little update here and it's just one area that we're watching. 40% chance of development here. It's way out in the Atlantic, closer to Africa than anything else, but it's headed westward and there's that 40% chance of development over the next five days. 77 degrees at 7 a.m. tomorrow, 99 for the high temperature, a southeast wind at 5 to 15. Eagle Pass 102, Kerrville 98, Holotus 96 tomorrow, Lavernia 101. So right around 100, but here's the key. Those dew points will fall off again in the afternoon, just like today. So the heat index, not really a factor during the hottest part of the day. That's at least some relief and a positive note. Anywhere from 100 to 103 then Saturday into next week. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, as far as their Super Bowl chances go, a lot of people will tell you the Cowboys will only go as far as Dak Prescott takes them, David. Unfortunately for him, there is one word that he's associated with, and that is interception. Yeah. He's trying to fix that this year. When we come back, we will hear from the face and the leader of the Cowboys, Larry Ramirez, with that. And the Houston Texans will watch the Tennessee Titans become the old Houston Oilers. You get that? We'll explain it coming up. 
Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Cowboys on the field for the second practice at camp, and for the first time this training camp, we get to hear from quarterback Dak Prescott. Talk about a guy with a lot of pressure on him. But here's the good news. Larry Ramirez knows how to handle pressure. He joins us live from Oxnard. Larry? <laughs> Yeah, you know what, David, entering his eighth season as quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, Dak Prescott is clearly looking to cut down on all the interceptions he threw last season when he had 15, which was tied for the most picks in the league, and that certainly will not get it done. Now, all eyes are always on Dak Prescott anytime he takes the field, and that's just part of the gig when you're quarterback number one for the Dallas Cowboys. In two practice sessions here in Oxnard, he's thrown two picks, one each day, but it's better to throw them now than in a game. And one of the big changes for Dak this season is the fact that coach Mike McCarthy will call the plays in game. Training camp is a great place for Dak McCarthy and the entire offense to get on the same page. And so far, Dak is liking what he sees. Mike's an aggressive guy, fun guy, um, spending a lot of time with him, just getting to know him, understanding what he wants on these plays, what he wants in each situation. Uh, just understanding his purpose allows me to play um, a little bit quicker, I guess, and uh, a little bit more free. And uh, as much as he's, I've, I've heard him read it, him say it, and he's told it to me a hundred times, it's about making the quarterback comfortable. It's about putting the quarterback in the best situation and um, allowing him to feel free and I feel that. I felt that all spring, and I'm feeling as we move forward, and that's what it's about is uh, us keeping those conversations ongoing so we're thinking of the same, and I can just play freely out there. As he's done in years past, Dak recently took some of his offensive teammates on a retreat near Atlanta to bond and practice as they look to get on the same page. And wide receiver Brandon Cooks, who was one of the 17 players there, really enjoyed that time with Dak and his new teammates. Anyway. Absolutely. I think from a football standpoint right away, just to be able to get that terminology in your head, you know, a couple weeks before camp, obviously summer, you take that time to just uh, focus on you. So a uh, football standpoint, get back in that frame of mind and it's, it's just building that, those relationships, obviously outside of the field, outside of the team. Uh, that's where you, you know, you're trying to build that trust um, and, you know, those great relationships. Tomorrow, the Cowboys will hold a walkthrough. Saturday will be popping around here thanks to the opening ceremony. Sunday, the players get a mandatory day off, and then Monday is a padded practice. And you know what? Dak will turn 30 years old on Saturday. And, of course, some of his younger teammates are giving him a hard time about that playfully. Of course, we'll have that at 10. David, back to you. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> thanks, Larry. Hey, it's some interesting news for the Texans when they hit the field this morning for their second training camp workout. The Texans finding out that their AFC rivals, the Tennessee Titans, are going to wear their Houston Oilers throwback jerseys when both teams meet in December. It'll be on the 17th in Nashville. Meanwhile, the Texans are busy learning the new system under head coach D'Amico Ryans. He was asked about the vibe he is getting from fans about the season. There's excitement in the city, and I, I sense that excitement. I feel it from our fans. Anytime I'm able to interact with our fans, which is very important to me to be able to interact with the fans because you know they're the people who drive and promote our game. So I'm thankful for our so the support of our fans here in Houston. They're fired up every time I see someone. They, you know, they're excited. They're encouraging to me, and they lift me up, right? And because I see like there's hope in the city, and I just want to be able to continue to spurn that hope and drive it along and when we play games you know in NRG want to see that same support from our fans have it packed out because it means a lot to us. Ryan's fired up just in press conferences isn't he? That's fun on that field. Hey also today wide receiver John Mechie the third has been cleared to return to camp. He was a Texans second round pick in 2022 but missed all of last season because he was diagnosed with APL. It's an acute myeloid leukemia. Still no word yet if he's going to be able to play for this season, but at least he's back on the field. So there's some inspiration for you if you're a Texan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not only are the Titans wearing yeah. the Houston Oiler blue on the inside of the jerseys, it says, love you blue. Ooh. Yeah. I don't, I don't, it's not right. No. Just, I don't, are they going to have the oil derrick on their helmets too? Probably. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Bad. It's going to happen. It's unfair. It is. Don't You're like right it. Back. Belongs to Houston. Death is a part of life and inevitable, but that thought can leave many people feeling anxious and afraid, especially when there is no shortage of tragic news these days. That anxiety has the potential to take over, but there are solutions. Stephen Cavazos takes us to a San Antonio home where people are turning their grief into peace. Solutions.
Missionaries is about highlighting problems, but more importantly, it's about the search for answers. Every opportunity that we can to talk about it and normalize it makes a difference. We show you the results and how it helps others. Sometimes there are limitations. It's hard and I don't always want to do it. If I don't do it, I'm not giving the best of myself. But when it comes to death, what is the solution? Well, there are a number of problems associated with this topic. In fact, the mere thought can incite fear in most people. Death anxiety can also be triggered from a traumatic event, like the loss of a loved one. But the path to peace does exist. My name is Aspen Amen, but when I do my gong work and my sound healing work, um, I use the name Sound Mirror because I prefer the focus to be on the work. And she has a passion to heal others using sound from a gong she considers to be sacred. I won't say that it's a one-time fix. It's not like you go one time and you're not afraid of dying anymore. No, that would be disingenuous to say. But what it does as a practice, it really allows you to release stress, which is the first thing we really have to do, is get people down and more grounded and more inside of themselves. And we tell them inside the gong meditation, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or a group session, we say release expectation. Just be, just be here. Just listen to the sounds, feel the vibrations, and what's going to happen is what you need to experience. It's something she prefers not to do on camera, but she allowed us to film a brief demonstration. I'm going to ask you to focus on your breath. Simply allowing your breath to be. The vibrations from the gong could be felt throughout my whole body, and when it was over, I felt a wave of peace. So that experience uh, definitely didn't feel how tight my body was mm -hmm. in general until after the, uh, the, I guess, the gong mm -hmm. <laughs> started uh, ringing. Mm -hmm. You could feel those vibrations yeah. really just relax you and it did feel like it kind of just takes you somewhere else. Studies show methods like this can help reduce stress, remove emotional blockages, and promote awareness and appreciation. So if we can do a practice, a meditation practice to get ourselves grounded in that reality that this happens to every one of us, then we're going to approach that practical side of preparing for the inevitable for ourselves and those around us. This peaceful practice is just one way some are embracing life and death at a boat contemplative care for the dying. For people here, it's simply a home. We care for people who are at the very end of life, abode partners with every hospice agency in town. And when hospice determines that their patient can no longer be at home, they can come to abode, come and live the rest of their days in one of our three beautiful bedrooms. We just love them up until they're ready to die. Executive Director Mary Thorsby says homes like abode were common prior to hospitals. People died at home. People were used to taking care of each other and, and being there for one another until they died. And it was very normal and natural. It was just a part of life. She showed us some of the unique features around the property, like this meditation labyrinth. The home is also staffed with people referred to as end-of-life navigators. There's also a number of programs to help normalize the idea of death and grief. Thorsby has seen people overcome their fears during her time at Abode. She believes it's a home that harbors hope. Our vision at Abode is that we live in a world where death is not feared and we live fully until we die. When we see guests who come here scared and then over the course of a couple of days or maybe a week or two, they just lean into it. They know they're dying. We've given them opportunity to say what needs to be said, reunite them with their families, talk about their lives, and just do the internal work that we all need to do before we die. 
So a week after we shot our story, I was invited back to Abode, but this time I decided not to bring the cameras just so I could get the full meditation experience. And I'll be honest, I was a little nervous at first because I wasn't sure what to expect, but overall the experience was calming, it was eye-opening and moving. But death anxiety is a real thing, and people still struggle with anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis. However, there are things you can still do to help. First, avoid things that trigger that anxiety, like alcohol, drug use, and even caffeine. Make sure you have a good support system around you. And lastly, if you feel something's off, make sure to talk to a professional. So after watching this story, how do you feel about death anxiety? Is it something that you fear or still struggle with? Or have you found a creative solution to combat those fears? We want to hear from you in our Solutionary series. You can scan this QR code here and tell us what issues you want us to address or what creative solutions that you have come up with. Subscribe to the Solutionaries channel to catch all of our coverage. We'll be right back.